Hey, this is John Leon Guerrero. We have two esteemed guests today, and both have been on the show before. But this week provided us with a special reason to have them on. First, I'll tell you about Ambassador Robert Hunter, whose posts in the White House are far too numerous for this intro, but I'll sprinkle just a few of them on you. The first of them was in service of President Lyndon Johnson. He eventually became the senior most official on Middle East affairs for the Carter administration from 1979 to 1981, yes, during the Iran hostage crisis. He went on to serve as ambassador to NATO from 1993 to 1998 and was the principal architect of the post-Cold War New NATO. On the other side of the virtual table is Colonel John McKay. During his illustrious career in the United States Marine Corps, he served two tours in Vietnam and was injured twice. He went on to earn a master's degree in government from Georgetown and another MA in national security strategy from the National War College in Washington, D.C. He's now an adjunct professor at Cal State Sacramento. Go Hornets! These two have a deep understanding of the strategic and cultural reasons, influences, and wishes of the people in this situation. Now, if you'll allow me, I want to take a second to remind you of our support of our favorite cause, Save the Brave. They're a certified 501c3 nonprofit organization dedicated to helping veterans cope with post-traumatic stress. You can read all about them at savethebrave.org. You can donate a few bucks to help them help some veterans who could use a hand. And you can set up recurring drafts from your PayPal account, which are really easy to swallow, and it helps them out a lot. Now, both Pete and I support Save the Brave with our time, and we have recurring contributions coming right out of our PayPal accounts. And Scott Husing supports them, too. He also serves on their board. They're doing great work, so I hope you'll join us in supporting them, too. And while we're at it, we also appreciate your support of the Break It Down show by rating and reviewing the show, by buying yourself a t-shirt or a hoodie, and by dropping us a line to let us know what you're thinking, what makes you listen in. Seeing your comments and shares helps new listeners find us. We really appreciate you doing it. And we hope you'll enjoy this very topical conversation with our guests today, Ambassador Robert Hunter and Colonel John McKay. Lions Rock Productions this is Jay this Moore. This is Greg Proops. This is Jordan Harbinger. This is Dexter from The Offspring. This is Nathan this is East. This Sebastian Yoder. This is Rick Moran. This is Stuart Copeland. This is Mick Gillette. This is Andy Summers. Hey, this is Scott Baxter. This is Gabby Reese. This is Rob Bell. Hey, this is John Leon Guerrero. Hey, and this is Pete A. Turner. Hey, this is Ambassador Robert Hunter, and you're listening to The Break It Down Show. Yeah, I've got an incredible couple of guests here. I've got Colonel John McKay. Who, as we all know, grew up as a as a preteen, you know, riding a donkey, speaking Quechua in South America, and working the uh, the mind the mind's train system. So, we've got men of the world here who've who've done it all. Um, and gosh, you should listen to their earlier episodes because it's a treasure trove of knowledge. And fellas, with the current events going on right now. I thought it would be important to have your guys' insight because you have dealt with numerous situations where, well, for example, John McKay was on a boat floating around in circles in the, in the uh, Mediterranean waiting to see if there was going to be a nuclear war in Cuba, among other things. Uh, Ambassador Hunter has, has worked with uh, every, every, at least every Democratic president directly. So let's talk a little bit about well, how you guys see this, and I guess I'll ask you first, Robert, how do you see this current escalation between uh, Iraq, Iran, America, Israel, all of the players with the uh, killing of General Soleimani? Well, in two words, very dangerous. Uh, secondly, we didn't have to be here. But third, as uh, John will tell you, having with his active service, uh, there's no point in saying, uh, gosh, how did we get here? Uh, let's look at the past. You got to deal with what you got now and move forward and see whether you can make some kind of sense about the future. Fully agree. Fully agree. So then let me ask you the question then, if if I'm the president and 
you know, Mayor Pete, this Pete, whatever. And I look at you two guys and I say, fellas, Iran is getting out of hand. They've killed Americans. They continue to undermine the entire Middle East or Orient. What the heck do we do? Well, the first thing I would say is that this particular president wouldn't ask either of us for our advice. <laughs> and as far as I can tell, he's not asking anybody who knows anything about the Middle East of what's going on, and he makes up his mind for reasons that don't ask me how he makes them up. But what I would do right now, in addition to shutting up for a while and to uh, keeping uh, uh, everybody a bit calm, but third, to start thinking through from the beginning what are America's fundamental interests in the Middle East, something that we have not done, if I may say so, for the last two or three administrations. Let me let me weigh in, Peter, on, on what Robert just said. That To me, that is absolutely critical. We have not defined, certainly not before 2000, March 2003, what is the national interest of the United States that we must put so many people into the Middle East and have so many people killed what is the fundamental national interest of the United States? And was that national interest critically threatened? Well, go ahead. Uh, I want, don't want to preempt uh, Mr. Pete, not Mayor Pete's <laughs> role. But what would you put, John, what would you put on that list? And then if you leave anything out, I'll add to it. Well, as I said, I, I, I think one of my top priorities would have been the... Uh, define clearly uh, what this action does that contributes to the preservation or the, the defense of the national interest. I don't think that question is ever. What, what would you call those national interests in the Middle East? Uh, I think it would be, uh, uh, in spite of all the turmoil, and after reading McIntosh Smith's book, I, I think our interest in the Middle East is, is, is uh, certainly economic, uh, it's diplomatic, um, and I, I would uh, uh, even go so far as to say that I think that there is a way or ways of working around uh, the different splits within that community, the whole Middle Eastern community, and I'm not talking just talking about uh, uh, Shia or, or Sunnah Sunna Shia split. I, I'm talking about the, the ethnic splits, the, the Persians, uh, they're not Arabs. Um, but there's 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 a number of things that I mean, I'm thinking off the top of my head here that we could be do that would be beneficial to the United States and beneficial to the world community. Uh, uh, that fall way, way, way uh, short of the necess necessity of using armed forces and violence. What do you want to add or change about that, Robert? Well, I think we've had a, a classic list of interests out there uh, in no particular order, because, uh, you know, there are no priorities when you have essentials. One is the flow of oil, uh, hopefully at stable prices. One of the questions is whether that's actually threatened, uh, given a truism that anybody who has oil has to sell it. I mean, they can't drink it is the old, the old line. So that's one item. Another item is that uh, we, the American people, have for the last 70 years taken very seriously the security uh, uh, of the state of Israel. And uh, if Israel is threatened, we have classically uh, in one way or another, uh, uh, help them preserve their security. So that's certainly another one. A third, of course, which directly relates to the United States and to the American people and to uh, our, our friends and allies abroad, is to try to do things that will reduce, if we cannot eliminate, uh, terrorism that emanates from different parts of, of that region. Uh, I think those are kind of the big three. Uh, on top of which, it would be nice to have a more stable region and also one in which Americans uh, and others can go about their business 
without wondering what's going to happen uh, uh, sometime in the next 24 hours to 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 their uh, their livelihood and to their lives. I have absolutely no problem. I think those are well articulated. Okay, so so let me see if I can push back in some ways to challenge us a little bit. We we have sanctions against Iran, and they continue to be combative, and they seem to escalate with that. They're killing Americans. They're they're killing Jordanians. They're openly threatening Israel. It's you know they're 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 attacking oil systems. Either it's refining or the ships moving it around. We need to do something. Is it is it reasonable to to do something like we're going to take military action to respond to this? I mean, <laughs> our complicated history with Iran aside, to include shooting down a civilian jetliner with our naval ships, is is there is there any reason in attacking uh, General Soleimani at all, or is this just inexcusable? You think? Well, I'll ask John to comment on that first. <laughs> I appreciate the deference. Sir. The I don't want. Well, I, I I could answer it, but but I I, I kind of like to hear your view first. My my view is that uh, uh, it, it was ill thought out. And uh, another question, and I assure both of you, I do not subscribe to conspiracy theories, but. With the possibility of the Senate hearings on the impeachment starting here in the foreseeable future, um, <coughs> would not something of this caliber divert attention from something the president rather would rather not dwell on? Um, I think that's one question. Um, the other question... You, you, you really think a president of the United States would do something like that for his personal interest? I can only think about five or six. I can only think of about five or six presidents who have done precisely that. Uh, this certainly does change the subject from impeachment, and I wouldn't be at all surprised if that was the primary motivation by Donald Trump. Nor, nor am I. That's the reason I mentioned it. And and I, I with with uh, what background I have in in uh, Latin America. Uh, the commencement of the Falkland War uh, in the early 80s was a hat trick of the First Order divert attention from the domestic problems and will take on the nasty British. I remember being in a meeting with a bunch of reporters and Margaret Thatcher after that, and some American reporter asked her the question, what were the political motives for going into the Falklands? And she got in Deep umbrage is just political motives, political moments. There were no political motives. We only did it because it was right, which uh, proved just the point you made. <laughs> okay, you. so so the impeachment thing is, is certainly something, but we also know that the general's targeting package has ended up on President Bush's desk, President Obama's desk. There's always someone there to account for lethal military action, and that's because it's it's worthy of consideration. So I don't want to paint this as being 100 percent, you know, about the impeachment. And of course, there's always self-interest. That's what presidents do. But how much of this can be considered like we've tried these other things? I'm this time we're going to try something military. Is that is that reasonable at all to say? He's just taking a left turn instead of the right that everybody's been taking. Well, I would say that tactically, he was trying to send a message to the Iranians that enough is enough. We're not going to have pinprick escalation. We're going to go big, and now you have to think about it. But then you have to back up and say, how did we get in this mess? Uh, as of 2003, which John uh, uh, referenced, uh, we had Iran contained. Yeah, that's we right. contained evolution. We had them contained uh, militarily in every other way. And then we invaded Iraq and blew everything apart for no good reason, which gave all kinds of opportunities to the Iranians and to others. And ever since, we've been playing a catch-up game to try to make up for that, uh, I think, after Vietnam, the second worst decision we made in the, in the modern era in, in foreign affairs. And in fact, uh, if you want to date the current problem, Barack Obama 
was able to negotiate with Iran an agreement to prevent Iran from getting nuclear weapons. That was 2015. They long named the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action. Uh, everybody supported it. The Russians, the Chinese, the British, the French, the Germans, the European Union, us and the Iranians. And then, uh, and then Trump comes in hating anything that Obama did and took us out of that agreement and therefore started this chain of reaction. Uh, so he's, he's got to suffer a, a lot of the responsibility for getting us to this point uh, where uh, we are in a state of escalation. Uh, we didn't have to get here. I, I would agree totally with Robert. And I think one of the questions when you do something <coughs> as acute as uh, assassinating, and, and that's what it was, assassinating a leading military figure that is uh, well-liked by the top leadership of the country, I, I think there's some very serious questions that should be asked. I, it, it's not something that's going to take six months to figure out, but you ought to get some fairly clever people around the table and say, okay, we do this. What's it do for us, number one? Number two, what's it do for the region? And how does the region react to us if we do it? I, I, I'm not sure those questions were asked. In fact, I'm not sure too many questions are asked in this administration. But uh, I agree with consequences that. Consequences of your actions. I, I mean, anybody that's done any type of planning, being in the civilian community or in uniform, you look at the consequences, be the economic, ecological, whatever. And, and is it worth it? And I, I don't think that's been done. If I were a conspiracy theory person, and I'm not, just as you were saying, uh, I would argue that whoever engineered this and sold it to the president uh, was against the president's policy of trying to separate the Iranian people from the Ayatollah, Ayatollah Khamenei, uh, because what this has done has done more to bring the Iranian people as a whole together against the United States than just about anything else we could have done. People did not aware, uh, were aware or chose to forget that Soleimani was easily the most popular person in the entire country, not because he was out killing Americans and doing all this stuff around the region, but during the Iraq-Iran war in the 1980s, which incidentally, we supported the Iraq side first covertly, then openly, he was a national hero. And for us to kill a national hero like that, it'd be like somebody going out and what, killing George Washington or something. I don't know. It's, it's a way to bring people together. And if you look at the millions of people who showed up at the funeral and all this kind of stuff, right now, even the Iranians who detest the clerical leadership have to say, uh, people should not be allowed to do this to our country. Uh, if I can back up with, with uh, another comparison, uh, back up what Robert just said, what would we as a country, not necessarily tapping directly on the leadership, what would we as a country have done if an adversary, let's say, took out General Petrarius or took out General Jim Mattis. We would have gone bananas. Yes, sir. Exactly. And in fact, this guy was better known and more popular than either of them. Uh, I'll True. go back to uh, the Colonel's experience or John's experience in Vietnam. Uh, one will remember that we did not try to kill Ho Chi Minh because as tough as things were, I think people recognized that if we were to kill Ho Chi Minh, which I'm sure we could have done, then any chance of getting out of Vietnam without uh, even more people getting killed than we had killed, uh, the chances would have gone to zero. Uh, I, have to, I have to show my true colors. Uh, my first tour in Vietnam was 1968. It was a very unusual tour, and we need not get into that. But I, I, I got to several parts of the country there and I came away from that tour realizing I was going to graduate from the Naval Academy the following year and I was going right to Vietnam 
I came out in 1967, September 1967, saying wrong war, wrong place. We did the wrong thing. That was severely or critically reinforced with my second tour from 1968 to 1969. And uh, it's not because I got shot up real bad twice. Uh, it's because I just had very serious misgivings uh, about how we had bungled into that situation. And not an unfair comparison, what Robert has just said, look what we were doing with Ho Chi Minh during World War II. Uh -huh. uh, uh, actually, up into 1949. And, and you say, why? What happened? Now, I understand the the boogeyman of international communism, uh, et cetera, uh, the great fear, particularly in 49, the fear of the <clears throat> Chinese Soviet Union, monolithic uh, communist giant devouring the world, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And you had the Joe McCarthy hearings. And, uh, you know, there's there's a, there's a hysteria, there's a national hysteria that can grip the country and seriously, seriously lead it astray. Let me pick up on that point. Right now, it is critically important for our country if we don't want to see another war, if we don't want to see more Americans getting killed, if we don't want to see ourselves getting into a situation in which we can't find a way out, just as we couldn't for a long time in Vietnam, it is very important to understand exactly what our interests are and to have the kind of national debate, which right now we're not having. No. Uh, there's certain things you can't say in the American media. They won't publish it. Uh, you've got a lot of members of Congress are running off uh, 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 with like, like uh, uh, chicken with their head cut off. You've got a president who's, and, and a secretary of state throwing gasoline on the fire. We've got some friends and allies in the region who are absolutely delighted if we carry their water by going to war with Iran. They would be absolutely delighted if we paid with American lives to secure their interests, not our interests. Again, I can't dispute <laughs> anything Robert says, Pete. Yeah, well, I mean, it's this you guys are describing the, the big problem. When when Robert and I did our show earlier, we were talking about the lack of uh, statesmen in the White House. And and Robert mentioned how George H.W. or George Bush, the elder, even more simple, was the last really decent and, and, and educated statesman. Has this been brewing no matter what we did? I mean, let's 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 be honest, like Al Gore didn't have answers to 9-11. I doubt if uh, John Kerry was going to do any better. John McCain is probably the most pugnacious guy of the last few to run, except for maybe Hillary Clinton. So did any of these these folks who wanted to be president, did any of them have a better path or a better solution? Or are we just continuing to bungle these things because foreign policy is hard and, and getting someone who's elected who's good at foreign policy is damn near impossible? Well, it's hard, but you can hire good people to tell you, uh, things you might want to think about. Uh, we could not have avoided what happened on 9-11. And what we did afterwards in terms of uh, responding, we as a nation wanted that done. But we sure as heck didn't need to go into uh, Iraq uh, two years later and blow the whole thing apart and buy ourselves a peck of trouble from which we're still suffering. Again, I fully concur with uh, with what Robert says. And also, Pete, the, the other thing that has happened, I, I would argue since, uh, probably since President Reagan, maybe perhaps Bill Clinton, elections of both parties has been into uncharted waters. And uh, I think the, the Republican and the Democratic Party that we, the, at least Robert and I have grown up with, you're too young, Pete. The, those traditional parties have been rent asunder by some very powerful social, economic, 
ideological forces, domestic forces, and and I think they're in the throes of trying to redefine themselves. And I think some of the flotsam and jutsam that has come to the surface is symbolized by uh, Donald Trump. Uh, is that the future of the country as far as uh, presidential contenders? Or are we going to in some way right the ship and get back to somebody like George W.H. Bush? Well, let me ask you, John, are you still young enough to run for president? I'll vote for you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just... I'm just a few years younger than you are. <laughs> I, uh, well, I, I think that puts it very succinctly what we're happy facing as a country itself. But we still got to run a foreign policy. And absolutely. most of running a foreign policy is having smart people around who know what's going on. Because the outside world doesn't care what kinds of domestic problems we're having. The outside absolutely. world doesn't care whether you have a Republican or a Democratic president because other countries have their own interests. And no matter who is in power in the United States, in Washington, you've got to deal with that world. And most presidents of both parties, if they're honest about things, come up with more or less the same answers because they're dealing with the same problems. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so we've sort of framed this. Since I, since I want to sharpen this a little bit. Please. Uh, a lot of what's been happening out there with regard, let's say in this case to Iran, has not been defined by American interests. Our interests were to contain the Iranian revolution, uh, to prevent Iran from exploiting some things, and to try to find a way to, uh, to improve relations if we could, as Obama did with the so-called JCPOA. But we've got some countries out there who have their own fish to fry. Uh, we have Saudi Arabia, which is a classic enemy of, uh, of Iran. They want us to fight their battle for them with Iran. The United Arab Emirates wants us to fight the battles. Uh, Israel has been threatened by, uh, uh, by Iran, but it also has its own ambitions, and it wants us to fight its battle <coughs> against Iran. Now, if we were to step back and say, how much of this do we need to do ourselves while protecting Israel, which is a necessity, how much of what we have been doing against Iran would we be doing? I say very little. I want to see a repatriation of American decision-making from countries in the Middle East back here to the United States. Now, how is that for cat among the pigeons? <laughs> <laughs> superb, superb. <laughs> yeah, I like it. Okay, so as a guy that's been on the ground, you know, in Iraq, especially Baghdad, I've had a chance, and, and not many people have had this opportunity because I stayed. So so while, while the folks in the green zone were, you know, having their salsa parties and hanging out with Robert, uh, I was on the ground. And uh, they hey, were, I, I, I don't do salsa parties. <laughs> <laughs> I'm having some fun at Robert's expense. But, you know, a totally different world two miles away. And so while the mortars were flying out of Sadr City or out of my immediate area where I was at, you know, I had to go run around and literally we had to stop operations because there'd be Iranian EFPs hanging from trees. Uh, we had people that got killed by these bombs. You know, there is this, this, the uh, look and, and I'm using them because it's easy just to blame things on them. But, you know, Jay Shalmati, the, the Mahdi army is out there. And, and I got to see firsthand the butchery that they put on their own people. You know, not necessarily the Jay Shalmati, but the, the people they intimidated. So there's real problems with these things and, and we have to deal with it if we're going to be there. And again, why are we there? Are we getting oil? Are we stabilizing the Mideast? Apparently not. But when I look around, I frankly, I'm happy that guy is dead because he was constantly trying to kill me and my friends and he continued to do that. And I'm positive that there were there was an intel package put together in that guy with things that they were planning and, and he became he became expendable from the point of view of a guy on the ground. So is there, is there any rationale in saying, yeah, this guy was enough of a problem. He was, you know, causing a lot of deaths and willing to fund Hezbollah. And by the way, big caveat that we're not talking about the Saudi Arabia state-sponsored terrorism, 
But I agree personally, as a guy that's been, you know, chased and, and randomly hunted by, by Iran in general, I'm kind of glad this guy's dead. John? I, I think we have to go back to what Robert said before, uh, and, and uh, uh, you followed up on it, Pete. What, what have we accomplished by doing yeah. this? Yeah, the guy on the ground, and I'm not belittling you know, the, the rank and file, but the guy on the ground has a completely different perspective that I think is quite limiting when you start talking about intelligent approach to geopolitics. Yeah. I, 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 would, I would argue the following. Somebody said, I thought very coachingly the other day, this guy deserved it, but was it wise? Yeah. Have we, did they think through what happens next? Uh, what happens after that? How do we finally try to come up with some kind of set of goals, set of strategies that down the road has at least a better chance than we've had for a long time of uh, this coming out the way we want it? Uh, I get tired of seeing us do what the Saudis want. I get tired of our supporting Israel beyond its security, but to its ambitions. Uh, Israel wants to cut, wanted to cut Iraq down to size, wanted to cut Iran down to size. Uh, fine, that's their goal, uh, and they're right, and they can have that goal if they want. But why should we invest in that if that means we become more of a target than we would otherwise have been? Hey, this is P.A. Turner from Lions Rock Productions. We create podcasts around here. And if you, your brand, or your company want to figure out how to do a podcast, just talk to me. I'll give you the advice on the right gear, the best plan, and show you how to take a podcast that makes sense for you, that's sustainable, that's scalable, and fun. Hit me up at Pete at BreakItDownShow.com. Let me help. I want to hear about it. And we wouldn't otherwise have been. Isn't taking out General Soleimani part of defending Israel and also keeping Israel from saying, hey, uh, since you're not going to take care of Hezbollah and help us deflate this, we're going to go fly sorties into Iran and, and hit central points for their infrastructure, at least in terms of, quote unquote, nuclear targets. Right. I mean, there's there there is something to that. Well, of course, there are no nuclear tar- targets to, to attack that wouldn't even be developing if we hadn't gotten out of the JCPOA, in part because. Mr. Trump didn't want uh, Obama to have an achievement, and also because Mr. Netanyahu, the prime minister of uh, Israel, was pushing Trump to do this, and Mohammed bin uh, uh, Salman, who who we kind of don't like anymore, because he uh, slaughtered this American, uh, uh, this uh, Saudi correspondent for the Washington Post, uh, because they wanted this to happen. Trump didn't have to do that and help get this particular ball rolling. Uh, we, we haven't had for some time anybody who says, let's think through what's good for the United States. Not say, we hate these guys because they do kill a lot of people, but how do we make it work for us in the long term? We just haven't been doing that. And as a result, we get one after another situation in which it looks like a good idea today, let's kill Joe Bloggs out there, but then what do you do? Exactly. Yeah, all right, so... We get back to this problem of there's just compounding problems. You know, we, we, we've already fuckered up the Middle East by, by compounding our bad decisions left and right and left and right. <sighs> Is there someone out there who's well, going to help guide us out of this? Well, Is, let me make a point. Yeah. Uh, I've been listening to John and, I, and I'm, I'm aware of everything else he's written. If he had had a senior job, let's say in the Obama administration, certainly in the Trump administration, where people would have listened to, to him, I don't think we would have been in this mess we are in today. I like to think if I'd been in the administration, uh, maybe we would have been less of a mess we are today. The problem is they don't bring in those people who know what they're doing because everybody wants a job, even if they don't know a darn thing about it. Uh, when we went into Iraq uh, in 2003, and we started to remake that country. We sent out people there, not only who didn't speak Arabic, but it didn't even, had never even heard of Iraq before. Uh, it's just stupid when we have so many talented Americans not to draw upon the best and put them in the top jobs. 
Uh, earlier this week, I heard a press conference by the Secretary of State, Mike Pompeo, who was talking about things that happened in Iran, which were either a tissue of lies or just a total exhibit a exhibition of ignorance. I mean, I, I just couldn't believe the Secretary of State could have said the things he did. Yeah. Well, I can, and that and with that individual, uh, it's, 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 it's sad. And you're absolutely right. And I, I think that uh, this this is a deja vu experience uh, post World War II, maybe a little bit with Korea, definitely with Vietnam. Uh, the number of people that, and again, I McCarthy here has had a lot to do with this, but the number of people that spoke Vietnamese had a feel for the country, uh, you know, had lived with the people, uh, understood the culture. Uh, there was a paucity of those types of people before we decided to, to trundle through the Gulf of Tonkin resolutions and uh, put ground troops into Vietnam and, and look where it led us. Uh, as I did in my review of uh, Tim McIntosh Smith's book, uh, you know, uh, this, this type of thinking or short-sightedness uh, will lead to the ultimate defeat of the United States in the Middle East. Uh, defeat in the sense that we're going to come out of there having accomplished very little. In my years in government, I found that anything you want to know, there's somebody in the U.S. government that knows it. There are two tasks. One, find that person, and second, listen to him or her. And I've sat in the Situation Room and listened to senior people who have refused to listen to people who know what they re what's really going on. Then it's compounded when you bring people in that are experts and they talk complete twaddle. Can you give us an example? Me? Yeah. Well, I Either one of you, whoever. I mean, I, obviously, we, we know. Look, I've been in the room, too. We have two, quote, unquote, experts, and they're they're saying opposite things. You know, they're, they're both licensed to talk about these things. But, but how do you sort out who's right and who's wrong? Then you ask some third person. Yeah. And you ask a fourth and a fifth, and over time you learn who you can trust. Yes, that's, that's, but you've had a situation, particularly in this administration, in which the president obviously doesn't care about what the facts are. Uh, he operates on impulse, and now you've got a secretary of uh, state who will say whatever will please the boss. Uh, in fact, his predecessor uh, got fired in part because. He told uh, the president what he didn't want to hear. Right. Yeah. Well, we could we could extrapolate that over to the attorney general too. So that too. <laughs> okay. So who is benefiting from all of this? All of this chaos created. I mean, we've been in the Middle East in terms of this this generation of trying to create some peace for you know over 15 years it'll be 20 years before we know before anything has even happened again and uh, obviously the middle east we have right now is not more stable than the one we had before well i would say the ayatollah uh, hamane right now is benefiting because he wants to quiet people in his country who are sick and tired of clerical rule and so he's delighted every time we do something like this to him. And that's one reason, frankly, he takes on Israel, because he knows if he takes on Israel, at least verbally, and that's going to lead people in this country to uh, press back against him. And he's delighted. Uh, the people here who don't want any change with Iran and the people in Iran who don't want any change with us, I mean, they're working for the same team and uh, neither country is benefiting. Another person who does benefit in the short term is obviously Prime Minister uh, Netanyahu. Yeah. He's a guy with a certain indictment. He's got an election coming up in March, and he is now saying quite openly, you see, you can't try me. you got to give me a pass. You can't throw me out because otherwise we're going to get attacked by the Iranians. Uh, and uh, maybe that's true, maybe not. But, but he's delighted by what's going on. I'm sure he is. Yeah. The average Israeli is not, and quite frankly, the Israeli military are not happy with it because they're the ones who have to defend the country. And some have been quite open about it 
by saying that Mr. Netanyahu is not helping the security of Israel. Of course, uh, the difference is the population of Israel has skin in the game, unlike in this country, where we have less than 1% of the population uh, actively engaged in the military, be it National Guard, active duty, deployed, whatever. Absolutely true. And, and uh, again, that's... Let me ask John, would you, would you bring back the draft of, or, or have a greater throughput in the military of average Americans so they would learn the kinds of things you learned uh, in Vietnam in particular about how to make your own judgments about what we're doing in the world? Let me, if I may, rephrase your, your question. I strongly support national service. How to sort that out from doing voluntary work at two years voluntary work at an AIDS hospital or uh, pick whatever you want and the military, that, that would have to be worked out. I was also witness to the bungle, and I use the word quite intentionally, of the selective service uh, system, uh, particularly near the end of the of the Vietnam debacle, um, we certainly could have done better. But there were influences like prestige and money and things like that. That you know, if you were if you were Joe Huckleberry from the hills of Tennessee, you could go. Um, but if your daddy had millions of dollars and you were up in New York. Uh, you could uh, be rated with uh, bone spurs. So, uh, uh, you know, uh, but you go when you say bone spurs, you say bone spurs. Do you have any particular individual in mind? Oh, of course not. Oh, of course not. I'm being whimsical, all right. Uh, just, just, just a common malady you know, of, of, of of people that less than less than heroic, let's say. So, so some kind of national service you think is important, whether it's working for forestry or Absolutely. whatever it is. What are your thoughts on that, uh, Robert? I agree with John entirely. The military, the professional military, uh, does not want just to take in anybody because to have a professional military, you have to have certain minimum metal standards and uh, intelligence and all that kind of stuff. And as they said for years, we don't just want to be a dumping ground for anybody who might not be able to get a job, if I can put it that way. But respecting that need for professionalism, I do believe there should be opportunities for everybody uh, when they're young uh, to go out and work to make the country better. Uh, some as abroad, like Peace Corps and things like that. And some, as uh, John just said, working in a, an AIDS hospital or going out and, and helping people in Appalachia or... Uh, uh, schools and parts of the country, all that kind of stuff. There's so much good that can be done by young people who are anxious to do good if you point them in the right direction. And what about the people, I mean, we, you and I talked about this before, Robert, like the, the folks like myself and Dr. Leday, who have this incredible body of knowledge from, from right now on the ground, fresh, and, and I can't get an audience with anybody. How do we improve that where people who want to help, who have you know, alternate solutions and, you know, points of view that are coming directly from the ground. How do we get better at listening to those folks and discovering who they are so we can put them to work to our benefit? Well, it starts with the leadership wanting to have these people engaged. And then it goes down from there to the levels where people might actually uh, do the day by day, having the opportunity and the requirement to reach out to folks who have experience. Mm. Uh, I suspect, John, here, nobody came to you after your Vietnam experience and say, uh, I was going to say soldier, I was going to say Marine. You were just out there. What can you tell us that will help us do a better job in the future? I bet you nobody said that to you. I'm not too sure anybody was interested. <laughs> That's the point. They're not interested. Yeah. And, and I'll tell you, when I, when I, you, Peter, you mentioned I've worked for a couple of presidents. Yeah. When I worked, when I worked for Jimmy Carter in the White House for two years, charge of Europe and two years of Middle East, I knew that anything I recommended up the line, 
gosh darn it, he might actually do it. <laughs> so before I'd recommend anything, I wanted to make sure that I could get the best advice I could get. Sometimes I'd get through regular channels and I'd look at it and it was kind of stupid. So then I would either go to somebody at the CIA or I would uh, go to somebody in the working level at the State Department or I'd go to somebody outside the government to say, what do you think about this? And I'd often come up with very different answers of the thing that the president of the United States needed to know that otherwise he wasn't going to be told about. And any president worth his salt uh, needs to do that or he or she is going to be a failure. I, I, I'm sounding like a parrot. I <laughs> very much agree with what Robert said. And I'm sure. Well, well, we, we both had a lot of experience and, and uh, I wish, I wish I'd have a chance to meet directly with you and we could talk, talk even more about these things, but uh, we, we all see the problems in common, I think. Yeah. Well, let me give you something very direct. Uh, yeah. Back in November, I went down to Montgomery, Alabama and lectured at a thing called Troy University. And they had a couple of guys speaking there who had been in Vietnam for a couple of years, not in Vietnam, sorry, in Afghanistan for a couple of years, working on issues about uh, the role of religion and the role uh -huh. of ethnicity and conflict and all that. And I listened to them for a while and I said, you know, you guys seem to know more about what's going on there than I can read in the newspapers. And when I, when I guess through my other sources, when you came back, was anybody prepared to listen to you? And they said, no, we tried, but we couldn't find anybody in the government who wanted to know what we'd learned. Yeah. That's dumb. Yeah. And it's frustrating because, you know, we have, we tried, we tried to find people. I tried to talk to my senators, my congressmen, and nobody, nobody could be bothered to, to hear the lessons. I mean, there are very few people who stay unit after unit, like these units would rotate over the top of me. And the thing I worked hardest on was getting to the unit to being able to perform sooner, right? They're still going to get there no matter what, to whatever level they're going to get to. But I had seen all of the mistakes. I'd seen how ill-prepared they were through training. And as I built up my influence with those units, I was able to get them to come about faster. But that was in no way valuable to anybody when I was in theater or when I came home because I, I, I tried and tried and tried and nobody would listen. And if it's true for me in that field, gosh, it's got to be true across the entire government in terms of how to do things better. All right. How do we solve this problem? Uh, I think we've all three identified a requirement uh, that is not being met and hasn't been met for a long time to find a way for people who've actually got knowledge and experience at least to be accessed and some requirement for people in government making decisions to have somebody on their teams reaching out for a second opinion. Does this make sense? Or maybe we're doing something wrong. Talk about kicking the can down the road. We, in government, and particularly in the military, uh, I think higher up you go, more so, uh, you you uh, assiduously avoid talking about personalities unless something bad comes out on somebody. Going back to what Robert just said, I, I, I honestly believe it has a great deal to do with the character of the individual that's involved, be it Robert trying to find out about the Middle East, uh, be it me about teaching in Latin America, uh, you know, you, you reach out and, and you use the experience that we all three have had. And, and uh, instead of sitting at your desk, typing away at your computer, pick up the bloody phone and say, hey, uh, you know, I know you and I aren't, aren't friends and, and we don't agree, but I sure as hell respect your opinion about Bolivia. How about having lunch together? Uh, that, you know, the, I, I don't want to sound like I'm blaming social media or anything, but working with my students at, at Sacramento State University, I, you know, I, number one, I don't allow any gadgets in my classroom at all. And, and my wife and I entertain, not all of them, but a, a good number of them. And, and it's, it, it's really amazing that how you can shape that. And, and, and you, talk, you, you talk about, how do you influence people? 
I, I don't know how you get people to go in and take care of age people. I mean, uh, you know, I, I would, I would, my, my mother was an oncology nurse for years and, uh, you know, dealing with little babies. I couldn't do it. I, it, it just can't, it's a special person, but you got to reach out and do it. And, and I'm very proud to say, and I do not recruit. I assure you, I do not recruit. Uh, I've taught since 2016, um, at, uh, California State University, Sacramento, and for my efforts based solely on the example that I present. You know, I've, I've got six people that are in or in the process of going in as officers in the armed forces of the United States. Can we not do somebody like a nurse in an oncology ward or a doctor that takes care of AIDS patients in San Francisco? Can we not get those type of people that are examples of what you want to be? Yeah. They are what, hey, you know, I like his demeanor. I like his bearing. I like his knowledge. I like his communication skills. I want to do that. Uh, I think that'd be a whole lot more effective than Facebook or Twitter or Netflix or whatever, Instagram. It's just a thought. And and we have, unfortunately, Robert has put his, absolutely put his thumb on the problem. We have such poor examples in national leadership. You know, we've got some at, at, at state level that I think are, are good examples. But name somebody in Washington today that you would say to your child, don't you want to be like he or don't you want to be like her? Boy. Yes. Yes. Well, on that, well, first, I, I very much touched and taken by what John said about his mother, people he meets, people are doing practical, real things to make this country better at the local level. Uh, what we need to find some way of doing is to get people at the national level to follow that kind of experience, to reach out and to try to build. And one thing that I think is very important. Uh, particularly in the career services, whether it's military and others, is to have bosses who will encourage people to take risks with ideas. <laughs> I, 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 I would say to somebody who worked for me, like at NATO, I said, don't tell me what I already know. Don't, don't pair it back to me. Tell me something I need to know. Mm. And if I'm out of line, uh, or, or I used to say is, uh, I will never, to use an old expression, I said to my staff at NATO, in a critical time for NATO, I said, I will never shoot the messenger except in one circumstance. If you know something and tell me too late yeah. for me to do something about it. But if you tell me something, if you want to, I, I had a brigadier general come to me, who worked for me at one point, who said, boss, you're out of your tree. You just don't know what you're talking about. And instead of throwing him out of the office, because and ambassador is a four star, right? I said, what are you talking about? He explained it. And I said, you know, in this case, I said, you're absolutely right. I changed my opinion directly because he had the guts to speak to me. And he knew that I wasn't going to fire him for speaking up to me. And that, frankly, I'd respect him more for it. Robert, well, you and I should talk at some level because I, we, our time and NATO overlapped. Uh, when were you there? Uh, I was there from uh, 91 to 94. I was on the military staff. And ah, we I overlapped was, for a year and a half then. We must have overlapped for a year and a half then. Uh, and, you know, I, and I, can't, I, can't, I, can't, I can't find it, but Admiral Smith, I believe, was the mill group command or the mil military mission commander. He, he was, he, well, there was Admiral Leighton Smith. Uh, Naples, there was also an Admiral Smith, I believe, who was the military representative uh, of the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff to the NATO Military Committee. He was a he was a four star admiral. Right. Are we talking about right. the same person? He was he was very good because you may or may not recall, I was at that time going in and out of Sarajevo. Uh, in fact, I was um, untechnically or not officially, 
I actually worked for General Morion, Philippe Morion in Sarajevo when he had UNPOPO. And uh, again, uh, we got along very, very nice. This was all before Srebrenica and all that. Uh, but it was uh, when they went into one of the concentration camps, uh, something I would rather forget about. But And uh, if I recall, I'm going on memory here, Robert, Field Marshal Richard Vinson was chairman of the military. I, I remember him well. I got to know him fairly well, but I never had the guts to say, how can a country have a field marshal with an armed force that's smaller than the U.S. Marine Corps? I... <laughs> <laughs> uh, he, was the very la- he was the very last field marshal in the British military. Right, right. And he recently that's a five, died. Five star, it's a five-star job. Well, I will tell you something. I don't know how much of this is going to be useful to Peter, but Field Marshal Vincent, who supposedly worked for NATO, took his directions, we were confident, from the British government, oh, and sure. they were determined, determined that NATO would not do anything militarily in Bosnia. And we lost two whole years because of British obstruction. And Vincent was part of the obstruction, even though that meant he wasn't doing the job he was hired to do. Huh. Well, I, NATO on the surface is a great kumbaya, but uh, I'll tell you, national interests play very, very big there. You take a look at the French. Uh, I just, uh, I was, I was very close to the number two guy that they did not have a military mission; they had a military representation, if I recall correctly. And you are correct. Uh, I, I, uh, both my wife and I are very partial to, to France and to, to the French. And, and uh, Colonel Surisu was, uh, um, you know, we're talking about ancient history, was wounded as a lieutenant in the Algerian War. Uh, look, mention that to, to young people today and you get the RCA dog look. I mean, really. <laughs> Well, actually, I was the guy who negotiated with the French there, which led to France rejoining uh, the military committee. And Outstanding sending on your part, to, sir. Outstanding. And sending people to the military mission. They didn't actually rejoin the integrated military command structure no. until, I think it was 2008. But they became full participants in the way in which we made decisions at NATO. Yeah, that that all happened after I left, and uh, then you know I was I was being slapped by the Marine Corps for not having command and everything. But then I, I turned around. I taught probably for less than a year at the War College at Fort McNair, and then got picked up. and I had the JTF down in Guantanamo Bay before Guantanamo Bay became a bad name uh, with the Cuban um, Haitian Cuban. Uh, migrant operation, which went smashingly well. Sounds to me you got you got the short straw on just about every job you had. <laughs> I hired Mario for it, but uh, uh, boy, that sounds like a lot of tough duties you've had. Uh, it was a challenge, uh, but um, as I tell my wife, and, and uh, in nautical terms, she's been around the buoy a couple of times herself. You know, there there, there were some real bad times, Robert. <laughs> But there were some really good times, and there were some fabulous people. John, why don't you uh, tell us the story about when you were working uh, in Cuba and trying to create some traction there? Because that's such a fascinating story, and I think it overlaps with um, Robert's time working with President Clinton. Yeah, that's that. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up, Pete. I I'm sure you knew this or know this, Robert. But the commanding officer of JTF-160, which was a migrant operation, started 1993 when all the Haitians started coming out and then Castro released a bunch of Cubans. Uh, They had some bad times. Uh, Part of that group went to Panama, um, I think under General Thurman. uh, And bad things happened down there at Howard Air Force Base and people got killed. Uh, but when I took over, and I took over from a fellow by the name of uh, um, 
Haskell, Admiral Haskell. Uh, he was a two star, went on to three star. Uh, Mike Haskell uh, was the last flag officer to command the JTF. I was the only non flag to command it, and I shut it down. But one of our collateral duties was negotiating supposedly under military to military contact uh, auspices with the Cubans. And I will tell you, my counterpart, General Perez Perez, was a man of outstanding stature in my eyes. And we had progressed, you, as you know, Robert, you get into these diplomatic talks and uh, depending on who you're with, including yourself, sometimes you go into theatrics, and and we had the theatrics about the violation of airspace, yak yak yak. But we had serious talks where we, uh, I certainly didn't make the decision. I fully supported it. General Sheehan had ACOM. Shalikashvili was uh, chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. And uh, we, we actually got crew served weapons off the line uh, uh, through those negotiations. Uh, again, I, 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 you'll probably take umbrage with me. Uh, 1996, uh, the uh, election year. And I was invited by General Perez Perez and by his boss, Raul Castro, to come and visit Cuba officially. And um, that was kicked up. General Sheehan fully supported it. General Shali Kasvili fully supported it. Uh, it was killed uh, in the National Security Council, and I'm told by the president. But you have to also remember 1996 was an election year, and most of those migrants were going to Florida. And... Uh, uh, Mr. Clinton, President Clinton, had not won the electoral votes in 92 in Florida. Uh, so, uh, again, a different perspective. Uh, I was going to follow that up with uh, with uh, Secretary, uh, former Secretary of State Schultz, who lives here in San Francisco, because uh, we were going to do right before the Obama administration announced it, we were going to do a joint uh, editorial for the Wall Street Journal, maybe the New York Times, if they'd have taken it, uh, on why uh, somebody's got to do something about uh, normalizing relations between the United States and Cuba. And I, I don't give a damn who who is in charge in Cuba. Uh, the, it, it, it's it's a travesty in my in my mind. And, and again, the emotionalism on both sides of that issue uh, surpassed, overruled and canceled out any type of rational thought. And I, I just, I felt on my experience with negotiating with the Cubans that uh, uh, we really could uh, do a good, uh, a very good deed. And one of the, not recorded, fortunately, one of the uh, incidents is footnote to history, be in my memoirs. General Sheehan flew down, and as you probably remember, Robert General Sheehan's a Marine general, uh, I think very highly of him. I like to think he thinks the same of me. We go back to Vietnam. Um, he came down and he uh, insisted, which is another story that is extremely amusing, but uh, it was very effective. And we met with the head of the Cuban military uh, at, at the uh, Northeast Gate. And... Uh, Absolutely nothing was accomplished, but it was done. It was done. It could have been followed up on. And uh, Now, John, why did you think I was going to disagree with any of that? Well, I was afraid that you might take umbrage because I mentioned Bill. Not at all. Well, obviously, uh, up to Shelley Cashley, who I knew very well, one of the finest military people I've ever had a chance I to work with, he, he was right, and Clinton was risk-averse. That's it. That was a mistake. I personally believe that we, if we hadn't, been, if it hadn't been for all the domestic politics in Florida, which have now been changing, incidentally, we right. could have wrapped up the thing with uh, the Cubans right after the end of the Cold War, if not earlier. 
You see, that was, uh, as, as Pete knows, I, I grew up in Latin America. I, I feel sometimes more comfortable speaking Spanish than I do English. And all the negotiations were, uh, there was no, there was, um, I had a translator by my side because it, they were recorded. I had to have a translator. But we, the general and I carried on wonderful, wonderful dialogues. Uh, and, and some of them got a little philosophical. But uh, uh, the setup for, for General Sheehan coming down and meeting with the head of the Cuban military, that uh, I'm not going to take up time on the air here, but that was, uh, uh, you know, it was one of those things. It was out of a Keystone Cops movie. You know, it was sort of a wink, a nudge. Uh, General jumps up. Of course, all the Cubans jump up. And he said, you know, he yelled at him, use a profanity. Carajo, he said, he said, sit down. And uh, he said, come on, Colonel, I'll give you a cigar. And the State Department guy was way at the end of the table. And we were on our side of the fence. And the uh, State Department guy couldn't get out there that quick. And I just simply said, General, this is what we've got to do. He said, we'll do it. And by that time, the State Department guy came out. And uh, anyway, little vignette. Missed it by that much. <laughs> well, I, I mean, uh, you know, they met at the they met at the northeast gate, uh, and uh, Sheehan, in his inimitable way, it happened to be the day that General Charlie Cosby Bailey came down and personally decorated me. Uh, you know, which was a dog and pony show. I'm very proud, but he, you know, got. I had all the troops were out there. The Cubans were out there. Uh, and, uh, you know, Sheehan said that, uh, he said, we'll wait till the chief, the chairman leaves. So we got on the helicopter and I said, you tell him? And he said, I did. And he said, don't fucking do it while I'm on the island. That was his word. Huh. We got back... Um, on the helicopter after we met at North ECA, take General Sheehan over the windward side so he get his plane back to Norfolk. And we're sitting there, the helicopters, you know, you got your earphones on, he grabs my knee, speaks into it, and he says, McKay, you can do the kumbaya with the State Department people. I said, thank you, General. Thank you. But, I love it. Well, listen, fellas, I've had you for more than an hour and I want to respect your time. Um, I just I think it's neat to have these conversations because you guys have not only been there and done that, but you've been there and done that enough times that you understand what that means at, at a higher level. And I think we all benefit from your, your wisdom and your experience. So I got to thank both of you for coming on the show. Thank you. Well, thank you very much.